So I'm delighted to introduce the guest speakers of the fifth and very last panel of our symposium constructing practice. This panel, NormCore, brings together three practices that have seemingly accepted or embraced some of the long-standing rules of the game of architectural practice, and in terms have found opportunities and critical modes of operation precisely from within them. We are pleased to welcome our guest speakers, Stéphanie Bru and Alexandre Theriot from uh, Bruter, Paris, Julian Schubert and Elena Schutz from uh, Something Fantastic, Berlin, and Aaron Forrest and Yasmin Vobis from Ultramodern, Providence, Rhode Island. Galia Solomonov from GSAP will moderate this very last uh, session. So we're ready to start. Stephanie and Alexandre. Yeah. one this one uh, okay good afternoon and uh, at first of course thank you very much for your uh, invitation uh, unfortunately uh, Stephanie could not come for different uh, reasons so I'm alone uh, just to present the work of the office or just to talk about uh, our practice uh, through this title uh, which is the neutrality of technique uh, so just to introduce, uh, I won't talk so much about the office, I mean how we work, but just to talk much more about the topics that we try to deal with uh, day after day. So uh, Stephanie and I, uh, we only know uh, how to sing by making things. And it would have been impossible for us to arrive to those discussions and questions today without doing our work day by day. So, but in our case, daily work never created thesis or corpus. To say it clearly, to make is our way of thinking. A way of thinking, it is also a way of communicating. And since uh, the beginning of our office, so 10 years ago, so our process is strongly linked with an archiving work, but not specific subject nor corpus has ever been predefined. Things just appeared as the work was moving forward. It is the only engine. For 10 years, things succeeded one another. Text, images, projects, constructions. Three years ago, we published the book Introduction. Uh, this book which uh, expresses our attempt to settle a day-by-day -day established thought. The book can be considered as an iconographic catalogue, mixing references, pictures, drawings, plans. Stepping back, it seems to me that this particular way of writing down information randomly is one of the most important things to preserve. When we are asked why, I do not have any other answers than saying that is the most honest way to do it. Honest because it, because it has been settled this way, and in the end, we could not work on another way. So the construction, step by step, of one single ensemble, will, uh, which tries to be totally free. In our work, if there is a plan, it is visible only when the journey has been made. The whole singularity of our practice is created by a linear jumble, because this is definitely a jumble. Questions never appear right away. They settle and mix during the work process. We are therefore trying to build a coherent work where projects hold onto each other looking for a common base. So this common base is to build usual object, useful, poetic, for a day-to-day -day use. So we found this image while working on the Berlin New Museum competition in Berlin. And this photo montage was made by Francesco Venezia. It places next to each other two iconic buildings, the Acropolis and the new gallery by Miss. So the real subject that simulates us is here is not really a time nor a style question. It is more about the connection between architecture and program between support and supply. In fact, our architecture is thought about 
made, how it becomes architecture, how it overtakes its spatial condition and its rigidity in time, how it adapts itself in order to avoid obsolescence. This other picture does not talk about function nor program. Before anything, it defines some uses potential, a possible future. This picture illustrates a central question in our work, the question of malleability. How a building is able to absorb the evolution of uses. Beyond an extremely precise and defined program, the whole purpose is for us to organize a constructive and structural device. This device will be able to apprehend the reversibility of functions through time. In short, to give the buildings the possibility to progress and to offer to its users a form of liberty. For us, every project has to be considered as being part of an unfinished chain. It starts its way before us and will be pursued later on with someone probably carrying other ideas or agenda. Oops. In that sense, architecture is directly linked with the other who completes it. It is an intended for someone. It is an intended art, so never finished as a suggestion. In a way, all those pictures do not inform us about a building as an architecture, but about its uses. The pictures you just showed before have been taken in the Sport and Cultural Center in Paris we completed about two years ago. This building expressed this ambitious to disconnect form and function and to create the conditions for a flexible and progressive building. The purpose is to create a use incubator but also a new polarity in the city. Of course, it is obvious that we cannot predict the future, but we believe that our constructions must offer possibilities. And as architects, we have to imagine this world of possibilities. For us, to draw a structure is to conceive a malleability of uses. This malleability, it is the main question of exigence that we ask all of our buildings. In short, our buildings have to be strong enough to organize themselves until their, own, until their own mutation. And then we like to say that the only important program is the duty of adaptability. Structural irregularities which only exist because of this adaptability priority. The project then puts together in a compact volume a large diversity of functions, uses, atmospheres, materiality. Above all else, you can see a stratification of layers, formal and functional, in the meantime. Its plan is simple, intelligible. It is a square with slightly curved sides. It contains an optimized and simple device a beam column structure, a serving core, and a large free spaces for the large, largest inhabitability. It is about finding solutions that will, that will find echoes as much into the palace of technology as into a kind of inspired makeshift repair. We are more interested in the question of gathering together, of joining things than in architecture. Here, each organ takes part in a global composition of the building. For us, all the elements are independent, just as, as layers. It is an autonomous partition of singular elements. Each entity has its own constructive and aesthetic integrity. Some items may appear to have been removed from a catalogue, but they are of deliberate choice. From the bolts fixing the frame of the metal windows to the profile for the handrails, radiators, metal furniture, panels of tiles which cover some of the walls. 
all the details we lay to the others. Of course, this composition, element by element, also supports an idea of economy, where the bricolage is not far away aggregating elements without any order or any subordination. What interests us is to transmit the functional and economic problems on the formal problems, where the economy asserts itself as the decisive issue in the pro project development. It is the question of rightness, that is to say the sign of pragmatism which testifies to an undeniable, an undeniable sense of optimality. Of course, we do not underestimate the formal aspect in our project. For each of them, the goal is to offer the maximum livability for by organizing only two types of space, free space and serving spaces. Here the project is therefore a set of floors taken off the, the ground clearing a public square on the ground and a public belvedere on the roof. You have here a clear illustration on the ambitions of the project where each tray can accommodate any kind of uses. Openable and divisible spaces are achieving sporting event living room. In short, a sort of scenography in white. The indeterminacy of those uh, traits should not be understood as an open flexibility that would represent a spatial laissez -aller. On the contrary, a generous framework maximizing spatial qualities, nature, productivity, recreation, to improve the collective, the unpredictable, a possible joie de vivre. An optimistic vision in this idea of design and transformation, then maybe neutrality is finally freeing yourself from the programmatic constraints. This is the picture of the facade prototype. So from a constructive point of view, we are using specific techniques and strategies. The aim is to propose thermal, efficient buildings without compromising light and transparency. Because we want to bring the landscape in the building to leave it, and that our buildings are easy to be read. An office project in rehabilitation and in extension in Paris Problem in reverse, modern and prototypical existing building from the 70s. And the concept of maximum capacities is, is amplified by the insertions of a new structure that follow the logic of the existing. The intervention can be summarized as a kind of micro-surgery, a limited but effective grafting game. A corner chamfer turned into a curve Slaps extended a new bias of simple façade. By following the logic of those decisions, it is the whole new constructive and spatial organization that is being put in place. Finally, what interests us is to produce buildings like skeletons, buildings that could even do without skin. It is the play with the current techniques that allows to offer a generosity of surface and use. Like this project in construction in Paris, which is a residence for researchers. But this glass screen that concentrates uses values, acoustic, fire, thermal constraints. It is a culmination of a hard work to preserve this simplicity reconciling the technical palette and inspired rafistolage or bricolage. Without going in the technical resolution, it is for us to push the limits by putting back technical or other prerequires.
We strive to work on simple and clearly defined forms. Kelly Ellsworth's work shows his um, obsessions with geometric work and those nuances, which for us translates by the ability of geometry to induce different spatialities. So we claim a spatial neutrality and an obvious and passionate pleasure of the plan. While most elements of the plan are rational, their organization is free and is imaginative, as if the reason and the feeling could go together in the organization of the project. The distinction between servant spaces and served spaces always seems deliberate. There are precise constructions that serve open spaces and clear, minimum structure for maximum use. In those compositions, each element, structure, system, partitions, facade, maintain their own technical and aesthetic autonomy. Last winter, we won with Baukunst from Brussels a competition for a university uh, building on the campus of Lausanne in Switzerland. So I guess you know some of the buildings that you have on the map. I think this project probably crystallizes all our obsessions because all the time we work with our obsessions. A flexible infrastructure that can transform characters and behaviors, induce changes, integrate progress and development. A building as an infrastructure that offers a radical separate structure and technical facilities in order to allow a total reconfiguration of the trace and to ensure a, re a reversibility of its program throughout the life of the building. Our attention is now focused on the membrane that manages the relationship with the external environment in order to promote the emergence of a collective life that will organize freely of those traits. This space manages the climatic and social transition between inside and outside. In those conditions, the project does not seek to transform its environment, but to continue the evolution of a typology proven on the campus by simply updating its potential as an infrastructure. So as a conclusion, all those constructions have in common our desire to exacerbate contradictions cultural, technical, and artistic contradictions and to make something productive. So you understood we are not theoretical or dogmatic architects. The main purpose is to remind from this lecture is that all those images, drawings, reflect more an attitude of ours that is not so much the search for beauty as freedom. Thank you. Julian Schubert and uh, Elena Schutz. Um, hello, um, I am Elena Schutz. I am from uh, Something Fantastic from Berlin, and I actually have my two partners with me, um, Leonard Streich, who is sitting there in the back wave, uh, and uh, Julian Schubert, who's at the door. Um, we, <laughs> um, actually, we tried for this, like we took the occasion to um, kind of self-analyze our office and like us um, uh, working together. And uh, so I'm, I'm not going to really show you pr projects of ours. I will only like maybe touch on them to show specific aspects that uh, to illustrate how we work but please excuse me if I'm not like really going into detail so you sometimes won't be able to really 
understand the actual project itself. But that's how um, it's supposed to be for the moment. <laughs> um, so um, the financial and economic crisis, I think, um, for many of us that have uh, spoken today, I think, um, uh, is in some way, in different ways, important. Like, for some of us, a turning point. Um, uh, for us, actually, um, we didn't exist before the crisis. So um, we started our office in 2010. So in a way, for us, like, working as architects, we have only worked in crisis or a post-crisis um, condition. So for us, um, crisis or post-crisis is actually like the normal, the, the zero. And um, um, I like to think of um, what was before the crisis, which is I guess, obviously for people who have worked um, in, the, in the situation before, for me, feels almost a bit artificial or like not the, the natural situation where, of course, budgets are limited and of course resources are very limited. Um, but um, besides the fact that we are kind of a crisis uh, natives, I think um, uh, the actual moment um, when, the, uh, when everybody was talking about the crisis was for us also a moment where um, a big, uh, broader horizon opened. Um, we were just finishing our studies um, in 2009 and it was a moment when like very big questions were asked, where uh, things were questioned um, uh, regarding their uh, system relevance, like when people were thinking about like should this firm or this bank be saved or not, like people really asked, do we need this or not? Like what do we really need? So this graphic that is about like resources and the globe, I think everybody knows these kinds of graphics, it's just one of like a typical thing that you would find in the daily newspaper back then when it was not about like like the details didn't matter so much, but everybody was really asking, what do we want? Like, what do we have to do? Uh, uh, what is relevant? And uh, for us, just finishing our studies, of course, we were also wondering, like, what can we do? What is of relevance? Uh, what can we as architects do to be part of this bigger uh, game? And um, we then decided to, um, instead of doing kind of a traditional, um, it, it, at our university, traditional um, thesis project, which would be like designing a, a museum or an airport. Um, uh, we decided to, to make a book and actually make this book and collecting all the thoughts and all the um, interests that we have and also like kind of building a basis for what we would like to um, work as and what should be the focus of our work in the future. Um, and this book um, came out in 2010, right after we finished our studies and when we started our office. Um, maybe also one aspect uh, economically for us, um, starting our office right out of university was also, I think, strategically um, a good decision because, um, yeah, when you're a student, you have a very low, um, let's say, like, you don't need a lot. So starting an office out of this situation is kind of makes you economically very independent. And um, um, we have been working since then. This is our office in Berlin. It looks a bit um, more crowded now. This is when we just move in. Um, and um, now in 2017, um, we uh, kind of at least uh, formally structured our office um, in uh, two parts, in Something Fantastic, which is an architecture firm, um, and in Something Fantastic Art Department, um, which is um, art direction, graphic design, and um, other designs. So we're generally we're w working in a broader field of architecture. Um, but so this is, I would say, maybe the facade or the outside structure. Um, when we are looking at what we're doing um, every day at our office, um, we just sketched this this week, like to like thinking about what we're what what that's actually the time, the percentage of time that we're spending in different fields. And I think um, an an important part is teaching. We're teaching architecture um, and urbanism at uh, the ETH in Zurich. It's a postgraduate master program that is uh, focusing on mostly informal urbanism. Um, 
then there's this part, I, I put the label spatial design, like this is also architecture, but it's also exhibition design and it's interior design. Um, then graphic design, which I would say like two thirds is books, traditional, old traditional books, and um, almost all of them are on architecture. And um, actually the art direction part is the only part that is, can be completely um, unconnected to architecture, while all the other parts are connected to architecture. And the tiny slice of planning is when we're actually planning a project to be realized. This part is also so small because most of the time when we're working in architecture, we are collaborating with other firms. So we leave like this, um, the part of the actual realization to other partners. Um, I would like to show you, a, a, in a way, in several ways, typical project, uh, and also project that where we kind of like the mechanisms and how it's working, um, because first of all, we like uh, if we can apply all these different um, parts of our work in a project, so we can like kind of have a like make a, a, a package a wholesome package that is also kind of consistent in itself. Um, and the other reason why this project is kind of um, typical for us is because we were involved in a very early stage. Um, and um, the project is the uh, exhibition at the uh, German pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennial. <coughs> and um, for this project, like, we talked to the curator even before he decided to apply in the uh, competition that is then deciding who is curating and designing the the exhibition. So we got together and talked about the, the topic, which is um, arrival cities. And just so you understand the context, arrival cities are uh, neighborhoods in cities um, that are mostly used by people who are, or like by migrants or people who are arriving you in the city from other places, from the countryside. And uh, those neighborhoods have very specific qualities in helping those people kind of getting established in the new context. Um, and what we decided, um, so we were uh, responsible for the exhibition design, first of all, and we decided to display this kind of openness and this like lack of borders that uh, these arrival cities have by opening like opening the pavilion uh, to the outside and like adding additional entries and exits to uh, the pavilion to like actually uh, like architecturally change the um, pavilion. So um, we decided where the openings should be. We had like some struggle with the um, uh, local municipality about uh, is it possible to change this building or not. Um, and then of course we did all the, um, the 2D exhibition design, so we laid out the walls and we decided how, also how um, the content is going to be put on the wall. In this case, actually, we also printed all of the displays um, on our office printer in our office, and I also glued most of it uh, to the walls. We also designed the furniture uh, for the pavilion, or we chose the furniture in some cases. Um, put together the different uh, parts, or this is actually a, a piece of furniture that we designed, which is a, a phone charging station, which is of, of course like inspired by um, arrival cities and these like f yeah phone charging stations that exist in arrival cities. Um, then we also designed uh, the catalogs of the of the exhibition, and in those catalogs we also uh, designed the way that numbers and statistics and the information is going to be displayed. Um, and last but not least, we did the CI of the project and the invitations and the digital and the print um, uh, invitations and these kinds of things. We actually also designed uh, the party, um, the opening party. And this is, this of course gives us the chance uh, in a project like that to be, um, like yeah, to, to make a very consistent body of, uh, of work. And um, what is important for us that, so in this project, everything is connected to, of course, the topic of the exhibition. What is not important for us is to create a specific style. So we are not interested in um, creating a, a, a formal style that you can then, 
for example, recognize and say, oh, I think I know that this, this is most likely by something fantastic. I think this, is, this doesn't work. I, I don't think that this is possible and um, it's also not wanted by us. Um, and I think this is because we like to always adjust to uh, the actual topic. And I think um, another thing that is um, also that is more important to us than a formal uh, style is um, something that I now called um, overlying themes. I guess this is actually correctly, you would call this um, underlying themes. Um, but um, I think they're so important to us that I call them overlying themes. Uh, and these are generally things that, um, that are important to, yeah, let's say, really the three of us. It's things that uh, we discuss. It's um, uh, things that we um, believe in and that we have already believed in for years. They're sometimes changing a bit. They're sometimes adjusting a bit. But it's quite a stable set of, um, of topics that we care about. And they're often like combined appearing in a project. Um, some one, one more um, apparent and the other one maybe more in the background, but they're always there. Um, I make a, an example, maybe of a, it's, it's one of the like simpler and easier to understand and less complex of them, but I thought it um, makes the point. So um, here you see three projects of ours. Um, the first one is um, a fashion show design. Uh, we were asked to um, design a fashion show and um, uh, instead of like um, designing a setup and realizing a big uh, setup for the fashion show, putting the light, putting the music, um, putting the sound, uh, we looked in Berlin for a just like suitable place that would have already all these features that we thought are uh, the right uh, features and are like just like suitable for the label. And we decided on uh, Neue Nationalgalerie, and of course, because uh, this place is not for rent, never, um, and if it was, it's not affordable, um, we decided to just stick to the house rules of the museum and design the fashion show according to those rules. So we're not breaking the rules, so nobody can really um, have a problem with us making a fashion show. Uh, and this is, um, so now comes the topic, minimal means. So we are using, of course, like almost no material means to do the fashion show and also very uh, limited material means. Actually, after the show, we picked up some uh, uh, cigarettes that the guests had left. And two hours later, we were sitting back in our office and we're like, yeah, did this just happen? Um, another example um, is um, a furniture um, series that we are, this, this is an ongoing project. Um, and it's, um, we're, we're developing furniture that can be uh, realized with minimal means. Um, and this is not only um, that the, the, the products that you use to build the furniture have to be available in a local uh, building store, but also in the case of that piece that I'm showing, which is a, a modular bar um, furniture, uh, you don't, uh, it's designed in a way that you do not have to make any cuts in the material because obviously cutting is complicated. So minimal means again. And the uh, third example I already told you earlier, um, it's the displays in the exhibition that are done um, with a, a A3 printer. And um, they're not only done with an A3 printer, but they're also black and white prints. Um, and I think this also shows it's not, it's not minimal means doesn't mean little means. It just means as little as possible and, of course, as much as necessary. And I think everybody who has ever used an A3 printer knows that usually the color prints are not very satisfying, like they do usually don't match and you, they're not like reliable. So we chose to use uh, black and white prints and <coughs> print on a uh, colored paper, uh, which is, I think, pretty much the best um, balance of uh, value and uh, beauty that you can achieve. Again, uh, minimal means. And of course, like the bigger posters, they're just put together from multiple sheets. Um, this was already, already almost it. Um, so um, now, then we were wondering, okay, what would we like to do in the future? This is the little uh, wish list. And um, we would like to stay diverse, meaning uh, we would like to not become experts. We would like to 
go on working in different parts of uh, the discipline. Um, ideally, we would also go um, a bit broader. And I think this is then connected also to the second uh, wish, which is staying free. We would like to be and stay independent from um, both um, economical, um, or I guess mostly uh, economical um, uh, limitations. And we feel um, that this is maybe partly also connected to um, staying small, meaning uh, that we do not want to be urged to um, uh, engage in certain projects just to keep a machine running that we have started. Um, we would like to become more professional. <laughs> and then the last part, I think, is uh, we would like to become developers. And I think this is, uh, has two parts. Uh, one, uh, developers in the actual real estate architecture sense, because I think earlier there was also the question of like the architects, what, do they have an agency? Um, I feel like, or we feel like, architects are usually or often uh, asked to join when already a lot of decisions have been taken. So we would actually like to become, and we're also working on this to happen, we would like to become developers. And But actually the second meaning of this is maybe the more important one. We would like to become developers uh, in the sense that we would like to um, um, start things ourselves and actually ask people to work on projects with us. We are not doing competition, so in that way, I think that was also a question that came up earlier. We are not speculative in the way that we're doing um, competitions, but we would like to become more speculative in the way that we would like to start new things and um, engage in projects that we do not know yet if they are ever going to happen or if they're ever going to pay back. Thank you. So our last guests, Aaron Forrest and Yasmin Vobis. So hello. Let's see. Hello. No. All right. Let's switch. Hello. Um, First of all, thank you, Enrique and Juan, for inviting us. It's been a really, really uh, fascinating and interesting day for us, um, in part because we identify with a lot of the struggles and the themes that we've heard so far. Um, but I guess to jump right in, so we are ultramodern. Uh, we are a small practice based in Providence, Rhode Island, um, from where we teach at RISD, but also um, currently at the Cooper Union. And we focus on a range of projects, um, but most of which are public in nature. So I think in a talk like this, it's quite tempting to try to explain the practice through a set of kind of final published images of projects. Um, but I think that you know, not only are these images kind of uh, easily available on the internet, and so therefore at this point not terribly unique, um, they, don't, they actually don't do much to explain the various turning points in our work together over the last several years. So for this talk, um, we have put together a series of alternate images uh, that represent inflection points in our practice. Some of them are going to be process images. Others are images by others that we find ourselves returning to over and over again in the course of our work. Um, we find these images important in large part because practice is in its nature contingent <coughs> upon external events, but in the course of rushing around to meet deadlines, uh, certain themes have emerged in the work and um, uh, around which we have started to build something perhaps a little less reactive, uh, more coherent and seemingly premeditated. Um, in that sense, you could say that the following images over the course of several years have constructed us as much as we have constructed the practice. Lila took my microphone. So um, yeah, so uh, the images are grouped um, kind of by theme or by these these words, and they aren't necessarily uh, chronological, um, and they, they are um, reflective. So it's not like we came up with this list of words when we started the practice and just said that's what we're going to do. But the um, the first one, which is really uh, quite important for us, is the word structure. Um, 
Both of us worked at uh, different times for the structural engineer, uh, Guy Nordenson, and as a result, uh, became quite interested in the way that structure can be understood as a kind of uh, proto-architecture, the kind of bare necessity for uh, creating a framework within the actions of various kinds can play out. And uh, working, the other really important thing for us about working uh, with Guy is that it showed us the power of a kind of more impersonal approach to uh, the creative process, one in which the um, design is valued for what it enables rather than a signature style. And um, importantly, this isn't a, an approach that devalues aesthetics, it just kind of reformulates the terms on which beauty is judged. Um, but the, the word has a second meaning referring to order or organization or social structure. And we've come to see these two definitions of structure as in constant dialogue with each other, uh, creating a kind of uh, productive friction between what is built and what's possible in every project. And looking back, this interest in the relationship between material order and social order informs even our first built project project, which was a cross-laminated timber pavilion built in Boston in 2014, uh, uh, which uh, is probably the least norm core of our projects. It's this moment when we were still kind of working with geometry as something that was present in the practice more so than recently. So actually, I'm going to go back. I think that that project um, kind of clarified a lot of things for us. Um, and I think one of the things that it helped us understand was that this kind of complex geometry ended up really kind of strongly prescribing the social interactions that could take place. And so in subsequent projects, we've really kind of tried to uh, focus more on action rather than on form. Um, so we, at some point, started looking back at this set of images that we actually made when we were in school together, in grad school. Um, seems like a long time ago now. <laughs> But uh, so what they were is that um, there was this webcam installed um, at Bryant Park and we figured out that we could start collecting images off of that webcam every 10 minutes. And so we started um, making these kind of digital averages of the space, right? So this is, um, we would take a full day or we would take a week. Um, in this case, it's a kind of full year long exposure of the park. And I think what was, what's intriguing in looking back at this work is that um, you really start to kind of see human uh, and architectural activity kind of blurring together. Um, we started to see the kind of material and the social as kind of co-equal um, elements playing off of rather than interfering with each other. Um, the image also kind of makes us think of architecture as a kind of framework for actions, you know, not as a kind of spectacle itself, but as a way to embrace multiple time scales and multiple publics. And looking at the city in this way, we started to understand uh, the necessity and perhaps also the pleasure of embracing these kinds of generic and generous frameworks for open-ended actions. And so we thought of this kind of overlay of activities in our uh, subsequent projects, often with drawings like these, uh, that kind of project potential inhabitations and where activities and furniture are just as present and as solid as the kind of traditional architecture which itself is kind of reduced down to a lightweight spatial framework. Um, we also, uh, working more with photography, started using kind of multiple exposures as a way to photograph our models uh, to understand them through layered and shifting patterns of inhabitation. And so thinking of the architecture as a kind of simple framework um, was crucial to make a kind of large scalar shift a viable proposition like in this project um, where the kind of simplicity of the approach um, really allowed for a kind of uh, maximum generosity. Um, and this is a good example of a, of a term that, um, that is definitely retrospective and isn't even our own. Um, we, uh, we were interviewed a, a little over a year ago by an intern uh, at the uh, Architectural League and she said, oh, I think your project has a lot to do with boundaries. And we were like, yeah, that's... That sounds good. So, um, <laughs> um, so it it, it it did become important that this kind of interest in action and habitation and social organization structure have some kind of material consequence. And so this actually led at, at first kind of unwittingly and then later more um, more uh, kind of intentionally into this multi-year series of investigations into different types of boundaries. 
Um, and this photograph of the rooftop of Alejandro de la Sota's uh, Maravillas Gymnasium has always kind of spoken to us about the power of a simple boundary to differentiate between inside and out. Um, the chain link fence here speaks to this kind of veiling of the playground from the adjacent city, which then sets up a space of separation for these new forms of uh, play to unfold. And the space itself uh, is just this kind of bare concrete slab, and it's the boundary that actually makes the, the actions possible. Um, and we were, we were, as a side note, we were introduced to the work of De La Sota by some uh, uh, Spanish studio professors we had in grad school. Uh, for myself uh, in Yaki Ablos and for Yasmin, uh, Luis Mancia, and Emilio Tunyon. And uh, they're very kind of influential in our way of thinking, um, partly because they just, um, at a moment when uh, architecture was really focused on kind of iconic form, they showed us how a kind of more simple um, and humble approach could um, kind of produce work that was more, even more powerful and beautiful than the things we were seeing uh, on the internet and the magazines at the time. Um, and so through a series of experiments, first with models and, and then at full scale, we began to explore how a uh, boundary could begin to kind of uh, shift definition by doing something as basic as taking a giant piece of fabric with some holes in it um, and draping it low enough that it would create a new datum separating floor from ceiling, uh, while the holes became rooms in which people could congregate and socialize. Or taking a rectangular box and just lining the perimeter with giant swing doors instead of just one single door, in which through opening and closing would allow varying degrees of openness for different types of gatherings and performances, while at the same time dramatically kind of deepening the distance from inside to out. Or in distributing a grid of tightly spaced vertical posts could start to create a field that operates somewhere between a kind of column and wall condition radically extending the boundary and perplexing the kind of notion of the interior. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about, I guess, the context of Providence, uh, where we moved three years ago, and that was really the time when we were able to really start the practice in earnest. Um, and, I mean, just to, to put it out there, I mean, we both love New York. We lived here for many years, but I think that moving away from New York was incredibly liberating. I mean, I, by comparison, you know, uh, time and space in Providence are cheap. And I think it's allowed us to take a lot more risks um, and to kind of construct a more, let's say, experimental practice than perhaps we would have here. Um, but the context of Providence also includes um, RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, and where we've both taught. And, you know, RISD, it's a bit of a cliche, but it has this kind of emphasis on making things, of kind of thinking through constructions. And being in the context of an art school, which was actually incredibly different than our own education, um, has really forced us to re reconsider um, both our working methods, but also our education. Um, and to think of practice really not as a kind of foregone conclusion or a kind of premeditated manifesto, but rather as a laboratory for testing ideas. And so, um, you know, for each of our projects, we work through many physical iterations, uh, with physical models, and this really allows us to engage in questions of how things are made and how they're made to stand up. Um, <laughs> we also make a lot of full-scale tests, um, you know, working often with rather conventional forms but unconventional materials. So, for example, here is a roof mock-up um, made entirely out of insect screen without any supporting structure. So, with through mock-ups like this, we really ask questions like, how do you discipline a material that is so inherently floppy? Um, something that so clearly resists any kind of architectural definition of firmness. Um, and so this notion of a kind of laboratory for testing things really allows us to also kind of absorb things into um, the discipline of architecture that would typically kind of resist it. Um, and I would also add, since we have this image in front of us, that the kind of um, possibility for failure is incredibly real in each of our projects. Um, but I think that's kind of what keeps things interesting. Um, and so often we also think about how the kind of construction process is part of the architectural idea. And I think this in part comes from, I think, working with Guy Nordensen. So um, where we, we kind of think very directly about these kind of very pragmatic um, issues. And in that sense, the kind of aesthetic of our projects is tied to questions of construction and kind of um, questions of production. And um, we often 
think about these existing processes as a starting point, you know, whether it's the lifting motion of a crane uh, or the maximum dimensions of mass timber that can be kind of trucked to a site. Um, and then how one could also reorganize these givens into kind of alternate and cohesive realities. Um, that is all to say, I think that we kind of, we kind of believe that without construction, there is no architecture and that the exchange of ideas and practices with labor and craft um, are kind of fundamental to our discipline. And so um, while the previous images start to um, construct an idea of what our interests are and how we got here, one thing that's really kind of fundamental in each project is that within the kind of apparent simplicity, they're able to accommodate uh, kind of varying levels of, of contradiction. And in contrast with a kind of orthodox minimalism, I'd say that they're rooted uh, more in friction rather than effortless resolution. And these images that we're sharing are important partly because they're able to at once embody those frictions and to clarify them. Um, that is, they become productive and instigators for architectural uh, thought. So the idea that a simple pairing of a technological concept, a very large flat roof made out of wood suspended by 13 point supports, can be combined with a simple idea of leisure, a couple resting on a picnic blanket, uh, an image lifted from an Eames film. Um, to push a project beyond the symbolic and turn it into a kind of typological challenge. That's ultimately the question that we keep returning to, which is how to take a few seemingly simple, innocuous ingredients and combine them in a way that begins to allow for complexity. So looking back at the project grid, um, but with the kind of critical process images uh, substitute for the, the final images, um, you can, these images are in some ways kind of functioning for us as diagrammatic agendas for each project. So each one can be understood as a combination of some kind, squaring material conditions against uh, the conceptual, the technological, and the social. And for this, th us, this is an approach that uh, values this kind of simultaneity of the architectural project and shouldn't necessarily be understood as a paring down or removal of, as, of architecture as much as an opening up in an effort to respond to the complexities of everyday life. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Galia. It's so good to meet everyone. First, uh, thank you, uh, Enrique and Juan, for putting such a uh, great group um, together today. It's been, um, as a non-young practitioner, uh, it's fantastic, uh, it's ultra modern uh, to have a group of people that have so much um, to, to offer. Uh, I, I will start by saying that um, if this same intention, this same idea of a panel was attempted uh, 20 years ago, um, I feel that it, the group would have been very different. and. Uh, one of the characteristics that I uh, think your presentations have in, is that um, none of you are defensive. You present your work in a very ma matter of fact, you know, this is what I do. And it's, it's a more self-assured way that what I remember people presenting uh, years ago. Um, I also feel like there is a uh, commonality, common themes. Uh, maybe people travel more, maybe people teach more, maybe people go to biennials more. But I, my first question to you is um, when you see today, the trajectory of today, and you compare that with a, you know, with a similar group of practitioners being presented to you in lectures when you were students, um, as a group, do you see any um, any coincidences or departures that are significant to you? From today to 20 years ago? Or, or when, when, when you were a student. Yeah. yeah, 20 years ago. Yeah, you, 20 years ago. <laughs> it's too long. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a great question. I mean, I think uh, there, there are some commonalities and there are some, some major differences. Uh, one of the commonalities, I think, is the interest in trying to do something out in the world. I think that 
um, when we were in, uh, in, in school, you know, between basically 2000 and 2008. Would um, you mind saying where was that? Yeah, Princeton yeah. University, yeah. Um, the, um, uh, I think that uh, architecture at that moment was, uh, was in a recovery of a different kind in the sense that uh, the, the um, academia had become so focused on issues of um, theory, uh, absent practice, that there is a whole new generation, um, many, many of whom are here today, actually, um, who were saying, no, we actually have to make things out in the world. And I think that was a big, uh, certainly an inspiration to us as students, that we were interested in, in, in that version of, um, of what was happening in the academy, uh, rather than the one that maybe preceded it 10 years earlier. Yeah. Um, that said, I think that there, uh, you know, every every architectural moment seems to be a kind of reaction to a previous moment, <laughs> and at that moment, the reaction to to kind of um, that that uh, relentless focus on theory was to just make a lot of architecture, <laughs> mm -hmm. and to really kind of emphasize the the design and the designer's role in making incredible things, um, and I think. Uh, for us, um, we wanted to kind of take a step back from that and think, how can architecture, um, especially you know, if we're if we're not working, uh, you know, we're just starting out. We have very small things available to us in terms of projects. How can we do have a kind of maximum impact with the kind of minimal set of things that, that we do have at hand? Um, Elena, when you talk, you, you talk about you know you had the uh, the war theory in the background almost in throughout the presentation <laughs> uh, and and uh, and it was in the context of work theory mm -hmm. work theory work theory um, what, what do you, would you say uh, has that um, would that work um, enlarge in importance over the years in your uh, in your eyes or would, 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 would the emphasis in practice at a certain point require that you become more pragmatic and less theoretical as a firm? So I think um, our office uh, touching theory is mostly in uh, our teaching, like the part where we do like research and display our research. <coughs> And um, a second part is um, that we work actually a lot on displaying ideas and theories, often not ourselves, but other people's. Um, so I don't even know if in an academic context what I consider theory would be accepted as theory yeah. because it's something quite... Um, Alive. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but if if we define theory as everything that is not m practical making, um, I think um, it is something very directly connected. Something that has always been parallel in our uh, work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Alexander, you you show that image of Ellsworth Kelly and then your plan immediately after, and and so one of the things that um, you also mentioned, uh, I think everyone had the word beauty at some point mentioned in your presentations, and um, and so I I was wondering uh, on uh, and you ended your presentation saying that you were in search for beauty uh, and freedom, like you, you wanted to preserve beauty and freedom. Um, not beauty, only freedom. Not beauty, only freedom. Not beauty, no. only freedom. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, okay, so from my misunderstanding of, um, mm -hmm. uh, of your statement, let's make that into a question. Uh, I, you know, I, Oh, I, as a practitioner today, I, many times I have the choice whether to do something beautiful or something new. And to me, 
doing something beautiful, it's, uh, it's important. It's, it's kind of like a motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, and freedom is a second, it's not so important. So for you, freedom, it's a, uh, yeah, sure. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's I mean, important. that's the main. I mean, I mean, it depends about the the, the topic or uh, the relationship between what and what. And uh, mm -hmm. just uh, the freedom is at first in the way to practice. I think it's really important, and that's. I think that's what we are looking for, all of us. I mean, that's what is so interesting in our uh, different uh, practices. Uh, just to find your own way. I mean, uh, whatever the, is going on in, because our uh, three countries, I mean, the context are really different. I think totally. that's absolutely, I mean, uh, the idea that the, the, the conditions of architecture are uh, strongly linked with the context, I mean, uh, about the economical uh, situation, and then you talk about this, I mean, you started with this uh, question, but this is not only the economical uh, context, so, you have all different, so for example, uh, I mean, this is our situation, so we did only competitions. And mm -hmm. all the projects uh, we built, uh, we won uh, through competition. We never succeeded to get a client, like a, a, a direct uh, commission. Maybe, our, maybe we had, but we didn't succeed to keep the client. Because you, we don't like so much to talk with the clients. It's just uh, when you won a comp when you win the competition, then the project is the client uh, choose the, the the project. Then there's no talk. Or of course, you can adapt some parts. So that's uh, really important for me. That that part. But uh, I think that's what I like so much uh, through the different presentations. This idea that uh, the conditions of architecture are really linked with the context. Uh, or not only economical one, so that's uh, the, the, the first one, the first thing. Uh, the other thing about uh, the, the freedom is, um, that's what I tried to explain uh, uh, in the beginning of the, the, the lecture, is of course, I mean, in our situation with Stephanie, we don't care so much about uh, the aesthetic result. I mean, uh, the, yeah, I mean, it's a result. It's not a goal. I mean, if it's if we succeed, I mean, of course you have a form, and then you have a result, and then you have a, an aesthetic approach. Uh, but this is not the target for us. I mean, uh, the way to develop the project, we try to uh, keep a certain distance with aesthetic, not, not to say, yeah, I like this, or I'd like to put the window uh, a little bit more on the left or a little bit more on the right. That's absolutely not a topic, and we try to protect ourselves from that kind of preoccupations because this is not uh, really objective uh, elements. So that's, um, and also about the, the way to use or just to live in the buildings, that's uh, quite important just to create the conditions of uh, freedom for the people who will uh, use the buildings. They probably uh, leave them. And that's really important just to preserve this idea that's, I think that's my, um, okay, this is our job, or this is our uh, really huge preoccupation to, create that conditions of freedom in the buildings. Now, freedom, it's, it's also a subjective, it, as a category, you know, yeah, sure. there are degrees of freedom. And so maybe we can discuss that uh, uh, also, for example, competitions, getting your work through competitions in France, where um, there is a wealth of competitions, it's different than getting your work through competitions in the United States, where there are much less competitions. Mm -hmm. And so can we kind of circulate around the table and talk about these specific, you know, freedom, freedom in your case is the freedom to respond to a project in the way you see fit. Uh, but, uh, um, and, and you also, uh, uh, Elena talked about freedom in the context of the Venice pav pav Pavilion mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of the premise for that project and in this, the future of the office as being developers and not being uh, the people that come at the end of the process mm -hmm. but becoming, uh, in ch being in charge of describing the, the process from the beginning. Um, so can, can you, Elena, explain, or either of you, what uh, freedom in the context of your work 
uh, is. Um, maybe I say something shortly. And then mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is maybe also connected to your first question when you asked like how did arch how was it were, did architectural practices function like 20 years ago and now I think in a way there is not really a default way of architectural practice um, so of course that also leaves you with even more decisions when you're like jumping in after university then you have even less orientation on what to do but on the other hand it also does give you a freedom because you, I think everybody has to at, the f at first invent what mm. his or her profession for the next 20, 30, 40 years is going to be like. Uh, and this I think is maybe the, uh, already a starting point uh, for that freedom. Um, and maybe, do you want to say something a bit more practical? Or? Um, <laughs> sorry. No, maybe not practical. I don't know if you if you already uh, mentioned it in the presentation, but I think for us the um, this freedom in an also in an economic. I mean, we have the feeling that practicing architecture, at least in Germany, is a very uh, economically a very precarious yes. thing to do. Um, so for us, the freedom means to to exactly to be diverse, to have a diverse set of things. So whenever we um, we work on a project, we could you know we could lose this client and all the clients that know that client because also we do other things. And and I think that for architectural firms that is difficult. And once you have this background of um, or you have a, an office in the background that you have to feed with projects. It's difficult to stay free. You know, it, that's our feeling yeah, sure. from our context, from mm -hmm. from the people we talk to, and from I mean, practicing architecture in Germany also seems to you actually deal more with lawyers than with construction site, like with the construction mm -hmm. industry. And um, so. I agree, it's very different in different yeah. contexts and, and so... But whatever the country is, it's a fight. I mean, uh, I mean, to preserve this freedom, I mean, to decide what you want to do. I mean, uh, what you said about the, the, the students, I think it's also something which is quite important. I mean, because at the end, all, I mean, what is so important is just to decide the way that you want to build. I mean, I that's really, I mean, when maybe, I don't know, now we teach for a few years, maybe two or three years, so it's something which is really new for us, but what is uh, so important for us, to, not to teach, because I don't know if we really succeed to teach architecture, but we teach some uh, elements and uh, maybe some, we try to open some doors. Um, it's much more to help everyone to find its, uh, his own way. I mean, uh, his own uh, obsessions, his own uh, preoccupations, and that's what is so important in uh, teaching, whatever the matter is. But and it's interesting that you're talking about teaching and practicing, going back to Aaron's point of how uh, it's different now than 10 years ago or 15 years ago in Princeton. Just to back up a bit, you know, the people that taught me, you know, 20 something years ago, uh, had a, a very strict separation between practice and theory. And so for them, practice was, um, for them, theory offered freedom. Writing mm -hmm. offered freedom. Practice uh, was the dirty thing. You know, practice was like, you go and work for SOM, you go and work for KPF. And so people that were teachers of mine, you know, 20 something years ago, would, um, would advocate for uh, the, the um, architect and the teacher, the teacher of architecture as a theoretician, not as a practicing um, person. And, and, uh, and that started to break, uh, I would say, pro you know, probably in the generation. So let's say you get somebody like uh, Bernard Schumi here, and that person uh, starts kind of merging the sense of practice may offer things that theory may not. And so then you get people like Stan Allen that then goes to, to Princeton. Uh, um, I imagine in the ETH you got people like 
you know, Greglin at some point, or um, mm -hmm. uh, some of those group of uh, practicing architects that were also theorists, mm -hmm. and that straddle between uh, the world of, let's say, Peter Eisenman on one side, and um, Bernard Schumi and things like that. And, and, and then you get the next generation, the generation that influences, influenced by the large um, theory practice offices like OMA, uh, where you get people that are totally on the other side of the spectrum, practice, pra practice, practice as, you know, big, or uh, I, I would say MBRDB was like a very, uh, um, 20 years ago, MBRDB would have been in this panel advocating for, for practice and the freedom in practice. And so things have changed uh, dramatically, but what I see is that you are um, going to a point where you can reconnect these, uh, the smaller practice. You know, you, you're not here giving a statistics about how many countries you have traveled in the last six months, how many employees you have, how many square feet you're doing. It's, it's the scale, it's important to you. And the scale, it's important to you, why? Because it offers a freedom, it, it offers the ability to do um, something specific that is, uh, that, it's, uh, that, that, that requires your care. Why is, or, or do you aspire to a 200 people office at some point? Um, no. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, 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 there's, a, there's a lot of interesting discussion. So I want yeah. to take a step back and just say I don't think that it's I don't think that beauty and freedom are in opposition with each mm -hmm. other whatsoever. One of the things that was really important about us leaving New York was to go to somewhere with a less strong design culture, and uh, to a place where uh, where there's lots of interest in doing good, interesting things, um, but there aren't architects there. <laughs> and, and, or there are, but they're, they're focused on doing things in the way that they've always done them. Um, and it was a huge opportunity for us to go and, and say, we, we have to be straightforward at some level because we don't have a lot of money for these projects. Um, but, uh, but we also can, can do something that's much more beautiful than they would get spending the same amount of money with another, another designer or just a contractor or something like that or buying a shed from Home Depot. Um, but in terms of scale, I think uh, we, we, um, we're always fighting against the small scale. We're actually yes. saying like, this, this is, we're not doing enough with this project. How do we make it bigger? How do we make it do more? And I don't think we're that interested in staying, you know, just a couple people in the office at one time. I, at the same time, I think there's a, I, I think that the, kind of boutique offices that have scaled up to hundreds of people are incredibly problematic for our world of architecture. And I think that um, it's important to, to think about that it's not just small versus large, but there is a kind of small to medium scale that I think can be extremely effective um, without necessarily getting totally impersonal. Mm -hmm. um, are there questions from the audience? Here. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, part of a very important thing about establishing a practice is giving it a name. And there have been some pretty interesting names uh, over the course of today with firms with words like welcome and local and gray. And, but this panel in particular has some pretty interesting names. Um, and this is not addressed to Alexander, but um, I find it actually even a little bit ironic um, that the names of, you know, uh, on this particular panel that's discussing a sort of more stripped down architecture are very superlative-like. So I'm just curious <laughs> what, um, what you're trying to convey or project in, in, in these names that you've chosen for your firms. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, in our case, something fantastic um, is a combination of uh, positive and undefined, not knowing exactly what, but it's good. Like, we're, we're optimists. We're, 
um, yeah, we just kind of like that it, the positive um, sound of it, but without saying exactly what. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I guess in our case, um, I should say that the name uh, was chosen when we were much younger, <laughs> when we were still in school, and we were um, quite obsessed with this uh, Robert Smithson essay called Ultramodern, and, um, which is this kind of beautiful rereading of a given situation. And so we always felt like that was a, a kind of um, great premise for a practice. Um, I think in thinking about it over the years, I think that uh, the name has taken on other meanings for us. And I think that um, also given the context of school, uh, you know, we're, we're, when we were taught by people like Sarah Whiting, there was this kind of reevaluation of modernism and this kind of rethinking of, of some of those principles. And I think that we are still working through some of those issues today. Mm -hmm. One more. Hey, uh, thank you. Um, I was curious, uh, in each of your practices, there was a sort of um, decision to be very disciplined, I think. Um, with Bruther, I think that window conversation was pretty clear about being disciplined, like not making, giving yourself the ability to not make a decision, basically. And I think ultra-modern, um, similarly, there's like this really restrained, stripped down, um, do as most as possible with the least. And I think something fantastic, the A3 printer is like the ultimate uh, <laughs> discipline um, and the black and white. So just, uh, does that like trigger anything for you guys or do you have an idea about that? I mean, do you know? Do you mean dis disciplined, like, like really? Yeah. Not like architecture. Not like arch. No. Um, no, I don't know. I, I think uh, the guy, the um, the gentleman from a local office earlier said that he liked to work smart, not hard, and that that sounds really good. I can't say that we work that smart, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, there is always this moment when you're designing something and you feel like you're just working too hard or trying to, trying to figure out something that's just too difficult and it turns out there's another answer that's much more straightforward and does everything that you want it to in a way that the more difficult answer couldn't. And that's something that we, um, that we try to keep in mind and it usually, we only figure it out like the night before deadline usually, but, it's <laughs> but it is a kind of important thing as, as a, for us as a, as a practice. Alexander, maybe I want to add something because I first misunderstood a bit. Mm -hmm. I thought it's like about the discipline of architecture, and I think that is something that maybe coming back to the uh, topic of our panel, the norm core. Mm -hmm. um, and I think norm core is a is a term that I mean it doesn't it actually doesn't mean normal core, but norm according to the norms. And I think our discipline sometimes has the problem that it is that whenever we build something new, and we here in this room discussing at the Columbia University, we do something that, that, that becomes or, or tries to become part of a piece of architecture. You know? And then it also, to, to many people I'm afraid, it looks like ah, a piece of architecture, which is for them totally different to a house or a building. And I think that's something that, that at least bothers us, where we think we, we should, maybe we have to practice differently in order to, to not just contribute pieces of architecture to the discipline of architecture, but to actually contribute to the city with a lot of houses. Or, you know what I'm, I mean? I think this is, this is maybe just a sort of conclusion, but a comment to, to this norm core uh, question and actually doubting that mm -hmm. we are norm core or we are trying to fit into uh, um, this kind of yeah. disciplinary 
body of work. I, I think it's really important what you said. I mean, just because, uh, I mean, to us, just a starting point, or maybe the topic of this conversation, and I think about uh, aesthetic. I mean, there was something which was uh, written in the, 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 the summary, I mean, in the booklet, and I think that's really important. I mean, just uh, the posture or uh, what is the attitude in front of a certain context. I mean, we just react and try to find a way. Um, I mean, so I'm not sure I, I, I exactly uh, understand your question, but about the discipline or uh, but whatever. I, I think that's really important just to, to focus uh, on this idea. I mean, just about norm core. I mean, that's really important just to maybe to uh, watch it, each uh, practice uh, through this uh, lens. Uh, lens. Yeah, yeah, that's really important. I mean, that's uh, just what is, uh, I mean, the idea just to do the, present, the, 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 the three presentations is uh, the, the idea on the backside is this one. So it's, uh, and I think it's a really good uh, lens. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think our organizers probably can take it from there, right? And, uh, Okay, well, uh, because as a closing remark, we are going to ask you for a last sentence uh, to add to your presentation after listening to the, the 15 presentations of your colleagues. No? So we have one microphone here, and Enrique, you formulate the question? Yeah, well, but basically part of the the attempt is to basically go back to one's uh, preliminary provocation to each one of you in terms of very severe rules as to how you would basically respond and present. Um, but with the acknowledgement also that, uh, that let's say, in, in we can definitely see where you stand in every one of the practices as a project. Uh, uh, whether or not uh, it was a deliberate decision or whether or not you're willing to embrace it as a deliberate decision. But in, in, the interesting thing is that basically the definition of a practice is probably something that happens retrospectively. M more often than not, when architects start a practice, have to pretend they have one until they have one, just as <laughs> you have to pretend a building is being built so that it does get built. Um, so, uh, so it is, in fact, a, something that could easily be discussed uh, in retrospect. So, so we, by the same token, we thought that basically since uh, the, the, event, the event has been, I mean, needless to say, an extraordinary uh, event on many different levels and for very different reasons, uh, the a sort of section across uh, sort of the, the architectural debate uh, worldwide, uh, a sort of insight into the work you're actually doing, and in fact, uh, a, an extraordinary response to the provocation of how you conceptualize or rethink your, your practice. So, but in, since the event is sort of over is that we're actually ready to start. In other words, uh, now it's the perfect moment to discuss um, what, what was basically, what is at stake with, uh, deliberately with your, with your practice. I mean, we, we saw bits and pieces of, of, that would be fascinating to basically discuss. Uh, I'm personally always interested in declarations of exclusion, like when, when you really, but that's, I mean, going back to Gallia, uh, generationally, uh, when I see an exclusion, I see a project, so I saw no competitions, uh, no public space because we don't do it well. Uh, no New York, which I thought was a really uh, uh, very accurate one, uh, uh, by the way. Um, so uh, it would be uh, interesting to basically engage you again in one last uh, point you'd like to make um, about uh, your practice now that the event, now that you basically everyone has listened to everyone else. Very short uh, sentences. And um, you know, our presentation was so much into explaining our locality, and now after listening to everyone else, um, I, I just wanted to start to travel again a lot <laughs> to feed ourselves with this other context as well. So I guess. Look at our final would be like uh, trying to be, you know, between the local and the global. That's exactly mm -hmm. what we are looking for. Good. Uh, 
you know, in the in the time sort of leading up to participating in the in today, um, I was uh, sort of very uh, self focused on w what on earth my practice actually you know is, um, and what has been super sort of inspiring about today sitting you know with all of you is just the kind of diversity and openness of what architectural practice can be today. Um, and so I think that, that's really what I would like to, to leave on. I think for us it's been uh, largely unintentional, but the one thing I think we have focused on uh, with a bit of foresight was to try and create a network of uh, people who share our values, whether they're in New York, whether they're in Mumbai, artisans, craftsmen, technicians, engineers, that as and when, you know, to the question of scalability, as and when an opportunity comes along, that it's a phone call, a Skype message, a, you know, an airline ticket, whatever it is that you can call on and draw on those resources as a way to defer having to make a decision about how you want to practice. Um, I, I would say I, I really enjoyed the diversity. Um, and and uh, if, we, if we have something in common, maybe uh, it is also the fact that not talking about your own projects and only talking 15 minutes, we all have <laughs> some difficulties <laughs> with. Um, um, but I think the, the I mean the contexts are are so diverse that also the practices are diverse. So I would love to learn more actually about the contexts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, I'll just say it was really wonderful. To, I agree with everyone saying that seeing the diversity of practices is great, and uh, I think we were uh, all uh, maybe or speaking only for myself, kind of intimidated by the prompt, which means it was probably a good one in, in, in that sense. Um, and uh, so, so I think we all thought very seriously about what is it that we do and what's important. But I think that one thing that I took away from seeing all of these diverse practices was that it seems like everyone really enjoys what they do. And I think that's a very important thing about practice is that it's extraordinarily enjoyable despite some of the kind of um, difficult parts and uh, I think that's something that we try to try to kind of think about in every project is it is it going to be fun and <laughs> I think it's a kind of simple thing about practice We're trying to read into what um, everyone has been talking about today what strikes uh, us and we talked about that before I think is that uh, for us all the um, all the discussions deal with the, the conflict that, that I feel that our generation has today, which is being torn between wanting to do a lot because there are also, there are a lot of structural problems um, that architecture and planning can and should deal with, but also wanting to do less because we know we are in a time where there is a huge environmental crisis. And in a way, I think uh, it struck us that no, no one spoke about it. We didn't either. Um, and we all flew here, <laughs> and, but but at the same time, you can really feel that it's la it's la you can say latent, or we, I think in, in latent in, in everyone's presentation, and I think it really represents also the struggle that we have, the internal struggle between the the problems that we need to solve and um, and the fact that we really need also in a way to change the way we do it, but we don't we don't really know how, and I, I think it's. Uh, um, Maybe the, the fact that we don't dare to speak of it is, is also interesting and uh, should be discussed with students later. Um, what I'd like um, during this day is probably to just to uh, try to catch the questions that uh, everybody tried to define. And I think that's probably the, the, the most difficult thing when you start your own practice, I mean, uh, what do you want to do? Because you can, uh, the, the word is so, I mean, the, the directions are so, uh, you have so many, so many di directions. And uh, 
So that's what I like, and, uh, and I think it's uh, not so easy to define it and just to, to get the, the, those questions. What, I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about the result and about uh, what each of us uh, we did, but much more about the questions that they are on the backside of the, of the practices. And that's, uh, so that's uh, really, yeah, uh, quite uh, stimulating. And moreover, as you said before, I mean, 15 offices and uh, 15 uh, ways uh, to practice and to try to define an approach and uh, to define in a certain way what is architecture. And that's really important uh, for me, so thank you. Um, yeah, so, okay, <laughs> probably it's my turn. <laughs> now I'm really thankful for being here because it's been quite interesting and at certain moments somebody asked uh, how uh, uh, do we see uh, ourselves in 20 years as a practice. And I think it's very interesting the fact that we are young practices, like we've been practicing for less than 10 years. So. Since this question appeared, I, I just can't stop thinking of myself or my practice or even your practices and wonder how these practices will be in like four years or maybe there's another constructing practice for people with more than 50 years in the practice. So <laughs> that would be nice to be there to see it. Um, I, have, I have to say that um, for me it's been a very surprising and um, kind of um, yeah, surprising experience, totally unexpected. I felt that with every presentation there were like mirrors coming up every now and then. And this been, this been really kind of releasing for, for myself at least, because I have to say that in the context of Mexico at least, because our office is mainly based in Mexico, we feel very often very alien to, to, the, to the local um, practices and to, and to the discussions there. And it's been very refreshing to see that other practices in opposite <laughs> points of the world are dealing with similar situations as what we're dealing, of, obviously with very different projects, very different ap approaches, but almost in parallel ways. I mean, it's a very strange feeling. I don't know if, 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 if you share this, Christoph, but um, yeah. This is my, <laughs> my opinion. Yeah. Okay. No more? We have... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Can I talk? Christmas. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so what I was going to say, I think um, it, I, I arrived a few days early from Joburg and uh, walked around New York for a couple of days and I kind of... In the, in the, at the end of that, I was like, what the, seeing everything that's going on here, <coughs> what, what the hell could I possibly contribute to this, to, this cause it's to this conversation? What could I say that would be new or interesting? And then arriving here, unfortunately, being uh, quite late in the day, uh, realizing how you know, similar, and, and I'm going to trust you when you, uh, you, when you guys say that these are the 15, <laughs> you know, it was a short list of, of 160 practices, and this is the, the cross section, but it's, it's amazing how similar the themes are, and uh, I feel encouraged. Um, yeah, and uh, I think it's uh, coming from Joburg as well, it's easy, easy to bullshit. I mean, you know, most, none of you have been there, so I could be, talk, could be lying. <laughs> <laughs> so I purposely tried to be honest, and, uh, and I'm, I'm happy I did, and yeah, yeah. We appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm just going to say that we usually work okay um, we usually work in Uganda or in Japan so we sometimes feel kind of the loneliness so we are only working in that country but it's the today it's very it's kind of the happy moment so 15 um, firms gathered here and we can find out some similarity or sympathy within the diversity, so it's very happy to share that moment. So, thank you. Um, well, I'm still di digesting this intense day of looking at different practices and contexts. I think it was really amazing what happened. 
Um, and I just want to think about like the, the format that you propose because uh, it really encouraged us to uh, throw out uh, like the basic of what we're doing uh, and not rely just on the projects and on the buildings, which is what we usually do in this kind of uh, context and, and discussions. Um, and that's a, yeah, it's a threatening in a way to start talking about ideas um, um, in, my, in a much more specific way than just uh, through photos or floor plans, which is the normal. Thank you. Uh, well, not much to say. Uh, it, uh, it was a great journey. And uh, I thought that uh, we learned a, a lot. And I'm very grateful for uh, being here. I think it's the same for Morena. I don't know if you want to say some words. Okay. And um, well, as uh, um, uh, Sorry, your name again? She said uh, the, this feeling of uh, travel. And, uh, <laughs> so I think this is a, a, a great thing that uh, for me too, and uh, go to see these uh, things that we saw here today. Okay, good. Um, I, I have a similar comment uh, about um, how grateful I feel because uh, in China also, we feel quite, quite isolated as uh, uh, architects uh, from the rest of the world. Uh, even though um, you know, the, the country is closely re very closely related in, in many other ways. Um, but to have a chance to discuss ideas uh, in this way is uh, extremely rare. Um, so this, uh, this has been fantastic. Um, also, I think there's this uh, notion of the global and the local. Uh, I, I just also find it very encouraging that I, I share so many of the values of, uh, of the work that I've seen, um, even though uh, I, I do feel a lot of distance from uh, uh, a lot of these uh, places of practice. Um, but one, one other thing I want to mention is I, I feel like uh, uh, there's uh, tr uh, really true um, authenticity, I think, to a lot of the work uh, that was shown. And um, I think one thing I've realized recently is that uh, architects really aren't risk takers in, in, in so many ways. And uh, what I saw today, I think, was um, really risky, risky stuff. Um, and uh, I, I think that's something that's worth thinking about. Really, what are the risks that we are taking? Because I think uh, uh, in order to develop our practices, there are a lot of barriers. Uh, I mean, I, I mentioned a lot of those, some of those barriers. Uh, but I think we do have the, I, I think from today, I feel very encouraged that, uh, um, that uh, you know, th those are things that we can deal with, but it requires a sort of rethinking of the, the way we practice. Um, but also with us, you know, start you know, a, a practice that is not very old, um, it, it, it's hard to have that confidence, um, and this this gives me confidence. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, I think um, to us, I think it's uh, such a great opportunity to revisit New York after ten years. Actually, uh, last time I was here uh, ten years ago, and um, I think a lot of things that already changed, but I think in a good way. Um, secondly, uh, uh, I think because we also uh, haven't traveled abroad since I, we have this <laughs> young kids for um, three years already. So there is a lot of dialogue and talks within inside ch China, but the topics are diff completely different <laughs> from today. So I think uh, we are really enjoying the uh, mental exercise to me today and showing such a diverse uh, scenery, I mean, all over the world for the young practice. I think it's a, such a good thing. The final thing is I think after today, we should go back to our <coughs> office and really seriously start to learn about crisis <laughs> in a positive way. <laughs> Thank you. 
I don't usually do this, but can we take a portrait of everyone in front of the screen? <laughs> <laughs> so the f we should have one. Yes, the big one. It's a lot of work. Can you go back to slide 15, please? <laughs> because 14? we have a diagram with a mix of all the practices presented here today and the moderator. So, but the, anyway, the last um, remark is an expression of uh, gratitude to all of you for accepting the rules of this difficult game to create your own work and, and tell uh, the story in 15 minutes. Uh, the conclusion is that be sure that these things are not happening to you because you are young. Uh, I think the whole discipline is having the same problems and for any reason uh, your offices are being now, the laboratories where these changes are happening. And so I think the, also the people here in the, in the room who have uh, old practices have learned it a lot and have recognized themselves in, 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 in your discourse. So, uh, it's wonderful that this has happened. Uh, it's uh, fantastic that the concerns of architects all around the world continue being the same or less, <laughs> uh, independent of uh, countries, contexts, uh, technological uh, situations, or, or, or universities, pedagogies, etc. And thank you for these 15 different English accents. And <laughs> And for bringing, I think, the vocabulary of the session will be fixed in, 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 the, in the notes that all we have in our papers. So that's it. Uh, here you have all of you uh, and your moderators. Uh, and I think the density of the, of the different biographies uh, are quite similar. And it demonstrates that there is an invisible uh, and a latent network of uh, less than 10 years established offices redefining the practice around the world. And that is, no. we celebrate absolutely that. Thank you very much.